Solar energy has been a quickly growing source of renewable energy production in the modern age, as people strive to create alternatives to conventional methods of energy production. The sun provides the same amount of energy to the earth in a single hour as humans use in an entire year, and harvesting even one thousandth of one percent of the solar energy that hits the earth would be enough to tremendously offset the use of non-renewable resources. While this may not seem difficult, several factors limit the power that can be obtained from solar cells. Recent improvements in the efficiency and cost of solar cell materials could make solar energy more widespread and available for both personal and industrial use. Humans have used solar energy indirectly for thousands of years through plants, which transform the energy of the sun into food and eventually fossil fuels. Sunlight has also been used for starting fires and even melting metal by concentrating the light into one spot. The production of electrical energy by a material exposed to light, a phenomenon known as the photovoltaic effect, was discovered in 1839 by the French physicist Edmond Becquerel, who noticed that an electrode could generate voltage when exposed to light. Many scientists throughout the late 1800s experimented with metals that showed photovoltaic properties, most notably selenium, which was used in Charles Fritz's 1883 solar cell. The solar cell was the first of its kind, and used a selenium wafer coated with a thin layer of gold, achieving an efficiency of less than 1%. A number of solar cells in the following few years were able to achieve similar efficiencies with other semiconductors. In 1939, Russell Ohl, an engineer at Bell Labs who had worked with diodes, created and explained the action of the PN junction. This junction, consisting of two adjacent semiconductors, one of which was doped, or modified with impurities, to have an excess of electrons, and the other, a deficit of electrons, allowed electrons to flow only in one direction. The junction would become the basis for almost every diode in existence, including the solar panels debuted by Bell Labs in 1954. These silicon-based cells had an efficiency around 6%, and are generally considered to be the first practical solar cells. Advancements in materials processing methods, such as the synthesis of single crystal semiconductors and the thermal oxidation of silicon to make its surface inert, allowed for the design of solar cells with 10% efficiency by the end of the decade. In the 1960s and 70s, various types of solar cells based on different semiconductors and semiconductor arrangements were created, some of which may have had low efficiencies, but laid the foundations for further advancement of solar cell technology. Modern commercially available solar panels are based on the single junction crystalline silicon cells developed in the 1950s and 60s. The silicon wafers in the cells are typically polycrystalline due to the relative simplicity of synthesizing polycrystalline silicon. Two layers of silicon form the PN junction essential for the function of the cell. Because silicon is a group 4 atom, the N side of the junction is doped with group 5 atoms such as phosphorus or arsenic, while the P side of the junction is doped with group 3 atoms such as gallium. By controlling the doping of each side of the junction, it is possible to control electrical properties of the solar cell based on the size of the doped region. The silicon wafers are layered between two metal surfaces, which allow for current flow from the panel to be applied elsewhere. Modern solar panels also implement glass layers that shield the silicon wafers from harmful radiation and limit reflection from inside the panel. The efficiency of single junction solar panels is theoretically limited to just over 33%, although most available solar cells only reach an efficiency of 20% and laboratory tests have managed to reach just under 30% efficiency. 
The efficiency of a solar cell is heavily dependent on the material used in the cell, as different materials will have different band gaps. The band gap of a material is the energy difference between the highest energy of the valence band and the lowest energy of the conduction band. In other words, it is the energy required to move an electron out of the valence band, in which it is bound to the atom, to the conduction band, in which it is free to move within the lattice and generate electric current. An incoming photon of light needs to have enough energy to overcome the band gap of a material in order to be able to generate current. If a photon does not have enough energy, it will simply be reflected or dissipated. Silicon is a widely used material in solar panels in part due to its band gap of 1.14 electron volts, the energy of which corresponds to a photon with a wavelength just over 1000 nanometers. Photons with lower wavelengths, and therefore higher energies, can move electrons from the valence band into the conduction band of silicon and generate a current. The solar irradiation that reaches Earth has a peak in the visible and ultra-visible light range around 600 nanometers, meaning the majority of sunlight that reaches the Earth can be transformed to electrical energy by silicon solar cells. The percentage of light absorbed that is then re-emitted as light instead of turned into electrical energy, known as the radiative recombination coefficient, is also very low for silicon, meaning that most absorbed light energy is retained in silicon-based solar cells. Nevertheless, other quantum phenomena including non-radiative recombination limit the efficiency of single-junction solar cells. While single-junction solar cells have a severely limited efficiency, other types of solar cells, such as multiple junction cells or nanocrystal cells, show much higher efficiencies, both theoretically and experimentally. Multi-junction solar cells, which implement several materials with different band gaps into one system, have been substantially developed due to their versatility. By implementing more than one junction, these systems can capture more of the light energy that otherwise would have been lost to relaxation. Many semiconductor alternatives to silicon, such as germanium, indium, gallium, and arsenide alloys, have been incorporated into multi-junction cells for their tunable band gap. By varying the alloy composition of a material such as indium gallium nitride, Band gap energies from 0.7 to 3.4 electron volts are obtainable, making the material ideal for minimizing solar cell energy loss. In addition to conventional semiconductors, these multi-junction solar cells can be combined with various photovoltaic compounds to improve their properties. Although these systems are promising, having a theoretical efficiency of almost 87%, the difficulty involved in manufacturing such complex solar cells makes them suitable for few specialized applications. Perovskite-structured materials consisting of a hybrid of organic and inorganic molecules have also been investigated and are one of the fastest-growing solar technologies. These materials take advantage of the coordination of metal atoms by halogens such as bromide or iodide, and are closely related to a group of materials known as transition metal oxides and nitrides in terms of their structure and dopant properties. The band gap of perovskites can be precisely tuned by controlling the composition and morphology of the perovskites as well as by controlling what substrate they are layered onto. Perovskites used in multi-junction solar cells have reached efficiencies of over 29%, and due to the simple process and low cost of manufacturing perovskite-coated surfaces, these materials show great promise. Solar cells that implement molecular dyes to sensitize metal oxides to sunlight, similar to methods used for many biosensing applications, are another potential technology. These dyes can be synthetic, such as ruthenium-based redox complexes, 
or, more recently, organic, such as the protein complexes derived from plant photosynthesis. A nanopatterned scaffolding layer is used to hold many dye molecules in one small place. These molecules capture light energy and pass it as electrons to metal electrodes. While these cells have been shown to have extremely high efficiency, they also deteriorate much faster than conventional cells, often losing most of their efficiency in just a few months. Organic photovoltaic materials, such as conducting polymers, are easy to manufacture and have band gaps that can be changed by varying functional groups in the polymers. Because of double bonds in their backbones, some polymers can carry current by delocalization of electrons, making them suitable for applications in solar cells, where they can capture electrons from donor molecules, or, in some cases, capture light and turn it into energy. These materials are often combined with small organic dyes, mentioned previously, which improves their efficiency. Dyes and organic polymers can easily be made into thin film cells, which, unlike conventional silicon solar panels, are flexible and lightweight. Processing methods such as 3D printing can be used to synthesize multiple layers of polymeric photovoltaics. Organic polymers can also easily be incorporated into multi-junction solar cells due to their simplicity in being formed into thin, see-through layers. Although polymeric solar cells have their advantages, they are also not very efficient and degrade quickly in the presence of light, which disrupts the double bonds critical to their function. Organic photovoltaic cells have reached efficiencies of just over 17% when used in multi-junction arrays, which on its own may not be good enough to challenge other types of solar cells, but combined with the ease of manufacturing and low cost, makes organic photovoltaics a subject of intense research. Nanoscale approaches to photovoltaics, including coating solar cells with nanocrystals and using quantum dots for the absorbing material, have proven to be efficient and less cost-intensive alternatives to silicon solar cells. Methods for synthesizing quantum dots, such as synthesis in colloids, can reliably produce nanoscale dots of different materials with uniform diameters. The band gaps of these dots can be changed by changing their sizes, which can be as simple as increasing or decreasing synthesis time. By using quantum dots of many diameters, it is possible to create solar cells that efficiently absorb many wavelengths of light, similar to multi-junction solar cells. The surfaces of solar cells can be coated with nanoscale materials, commonly by spin depositing quantum dots or nanocrystals onto the surface. The combination of several different types of solar cells is also becoming more common in research as alternatives to silicon become more and more advanced. For example, the combination of polymeric thin films with metallic nanoparticles can bring together the beneficial flexibility of polymers and the variable band gap of nanoparticles. Composite materials such as these are called fourth-generation photovoltaics, and, while promising, they are far from being applied to a large scale. Novel solar cells could be applied in many technologies, from pocket calculators to satellites in orbit. More specialized applications may require a certain type of solar cell, and many specialized solar cells have already been used in applications such as those in space stations and solar-powered satellites. Alternatively, solar cells that show a good balance between efficiency and cost could replace silicon-based solar panels in large-scale energy production. Incremental advancements in photovoltaic technology are made every year by thousands of researchers across the world, and as solar technology advances, we may see solar energy make drastic changes to the way we live. Thank you for watching. 
And as always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like or subscribe for more educational documentaries. Check out more videos on the channel or check out my friends' channels for more content.